appreciate everyone here tonight. If you would turn over to the book of Haggai, second chapter. I'd like to go over again uh, part of uh, chapter 2 that I covered last week. It really has to do with this uh, verses 6 and following. And uh, um, Well, let's do 5. According to the word that I covenanted you, with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains strong in you. And not fear. Well, when he came out of Egypt, he said he's going to be their God. And as long as they were faithful, he was. In verse uh, 6 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts once more, it means happened before, but once more it is a little while, and... Uh, that kind of specifies time. I will shake the heaven and the earth. And you see this same language over in uh, verse 21 when he's speaking to Zerubbabel. He said, I will shake heaven and earth there through. And it's, it's, it says more, more there. But in addition to shaking heaven and earth and seeing dry land, there's not anything left. He says, I, and I will shake the nations. Well, usually when he talks about nations, he's talking about the heathen nations. And they shall come to the desire of all nations. If you're looking at uh, ASV, it would say the uh, uh, valuable things or the, the uh, precious things. And I will fill this temple with glory. Well, which temple is he talking about? There have been, there's a Solomon's temple that was destroyed and Zerubbabel was building his temple. He'll finish it. And, of course, some lamented over it because it wasn't as glorious, it wasn't as uh, gilded as the uh, Solomon's temple. But, the, but along comes Herod later and he probably out does them all. He spends a lot of money on the temple. So, which temple is he talking about? Well, maybe he's not talking about any of them. <laughs> uh, there is the thought of some, and of course, uh, you know, there's the thought of a lot of others that when he says, this is fill this temple with glory is when Jesus was, was taught in the temple. Well, of course he taught in the temple. But there's an objection to that. Well, one's grammatical, and I'm not going to get into that. And uh, But one thing is that the uh, the four writers of the uh, their different gospel accounts, this passage is never mentioned. But it is mentioned. In Hebrews, the uh, 12th chapter, if you want to turn over to there, uh, verses 25 through 29, it quotes this passage. It says, They see that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Of course, who is that? This, this Jesus, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be made, uh, cannot be shaken, uh, may re remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. So this passage in Haggai 
uh, has clear messianic implications. So the temple that's being talked about is a spiritual temple. Well, what about Jesus speaking or teaching in the temple? Well, he did. But what did he say about it? You know, one of the accusations that was made against Jesus at his trial, and of course we read about it in John, the second chapter, I think verse 7, I'd have to look at it, but he says, uh, uh, speaking of this temple, this earthly temple, I'll destroy it, and uh, I'll raise it again in three days. And it says later on that he's, he was not talking about raising a, another physical temple. He was not talking about that. He was talking about his own body that's going to be raised after three days. So <clears throat> this temple that's going to be shaken uh, is the physical temple, and it's going to be replaced with a spiritual temple. And what is Jesus going, or different places going to say about uh, his temple? That, that's his body. He says, this temple is my body. That's what he's talking about. Well, what is his body? <clears throat> well, his, his body is the church, is it not? So the spiritual temple is the church. Now, this building is not the church. And we, I know just as a matter of convenience, a lot of times we call it the church. You know, we're going to church. You know. Well, this building is not the church. If it were the church, then just by the, the very fact, by one entering into this building, they'd be in the church. And that's clearly not the case. So it's a spiritual temple. And there are things that must be done spiritually for one to get into the spiritual temple, the church. Of course, you can read about that on your own time, but uh, there's a process for doing that. But it also says here, talking about the nations, I will shake all the nations. Well, indeed, the, the nations were shaken uh, and that's the heathen nations and of course uh, uh, all the heathen nations that we know of and and some of the maybe some of the ones we're living in right now uh, they've been shaken they've been destroyed the uh, uh, Syrian nation was destroyed the Babylonian nation was destroyed shaken if you will the uh, Middle Persian nation was destroyed the Greek nation was, the Roman nation was. All these empires were destroyed. And, and you look out over history and see uh, how many nations have been destroyed. And, of course, the temple, the physical temple was, well, all the physical temples were destroyed. And of course, in the 80s, 70s, when the uh, biggest destruction took place. And as a, just as a matter of Interest. If you have that interest, you can go on YouTube, and there'll be a, uh, of course, a recreation. Not <laughs> there's no reporters on, on the scene there, but there'd be a recreation of the, of the uh, destruction of the temple by the Romans. Very, very interesting. If you uh, have an incl inclination to do that, but uh, but this spiritual kingdom is so much more glorious than any of these three temples that existed, physical temples that existed, even though I, I think you would probably have found, if you had, could have seen them, thought that those buildings were, were really magnificent. He talks about the silver is mine, the gold is mine, and there's a lot of silver and gold in these temples. But God owns everything. So even the, the silver and the gold in the temple that was used to gild the temples, that belonged to God. And he could do with it with, with uh, whatever he wanted to. 
And so he says the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the uh, former. And in this place, this latter temple, in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. So we're uh, certainly talking about the spiritual temple. In verse uh, 10, uh, there's the third message that was given to Haggai. It says, On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, uh, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Now he's given some examples here uh, because apparently the uh, there was a remnant of people here that were still uh, disobedient and and, and uh, the blessings were not as they had expected. Of course, you know, it's already been said here that they did, did enjoy the blessings because they were had uh, been idle in rebuilding the temple for 16 years. So he gives a couple of examples here of of uh, to impress upon them what they needed to do, and he says here in verse 11, thus says the Lord of hosts, now ask the priest concerning the law, and that's who should be teaching the law as a priest. He says, if one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and they did have some sort of uh, pouch or something to carry holy meat, and with the edges he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, or any food with it, uh, will it become holy? Well, they gave the, the correct answer. And the priest answered said, no. If something that is holy touches or comes in contact with something that's not holy, that doesn't change the status of the, that thing that's holy. It must do those things. It in of itself must do those things to make it holy. And they hadn't done that. They hadn't done those things to make themselves holy. In verse 13, and Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? And again, the priest gave the right answer. The priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. And that was a matter of uh, law that uh, if you touched a dead body, then you were ceremonially unclean for a certain time. If you touched anything, that also made it unclean. So the uh, Jews had been unclean because of their failure to rebuild the temple. So everything they touched, trying to grow things, this, that, and the other, was also unclean. So until they cleansed themselves, uh, they were not going to prosper. Then 14, and Haggai answered and said, so, it is this pe so is this people, and so is this nation before me. You've got to clean yourself. You've got to make yourself clean. Says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands. What they offer there is unclean. That's why they, that's why they didn't prosper. They were... Uh, unclean so everything they touched was unclean so in verse 15 it says now carefully consider from this day forward from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord you know when it was laid 16 years previously since those days when the foundation was uh, first laid since those days when one came to a heap of 20 Ephahs, there were but ten. And when one came to the wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the press, there were but twenty. I struck you with blight and mildew, and that was not an uncommon uh, punishment for the people. And uh, struck you with blight and mildew and hell and all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me. So they were unclean, so the things that they... Uh, touched or tried to grow this, that, and the other was, was also unclean, did not prosper. In verse 18, <clears throat> consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the month, the ninth month, from this day, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. 
Now think back over the past 16 years. Is the seed still in the barn? Well, no. As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded. But from, these, from this day forward, how I bless you, because they started to, to rebuild the temple. And I said it before that uh, they probably did not recognize that these uh, failure, crop failures and what have you was a result of their own uh, disobedience. They, I doubt that they recognized that. And that's why the prophet had to be sent to them to, to remind them that it was because of their disobedience. But once they uh, start, uh, started rebuilding the temple, he said, from this day forward, I will bless you. So the fourth message is, uh, begins in verse 20. Uh, again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the, of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. And, and remember, it's through uh, the, the, the Christ came through the lineage of uh, Zerubbabel. I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. And he, indeed he did. I will overthrow the chariots. Chariots were instruments of war. That uh, was military power. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. Their horses, horses are instruments of war, and their riders shall come down, everyone by the sword of his brother. And it was characteristic of the heathen nations of uh, that time, and, and I guess it's kind of taken on a different uh, uh, manifestation today, but back then, you know, some of your worst enemies were from your own household. Uh, they wouldn't think twice about killing you to, in order to achieve the uh, the kingship. And also uh, physical brothers, you know, brothers of the flesh, but also uh, brothers, uh, kin or people of a similar ethnic background from uh, neighboring neighbors. They wouldn't think anything at all about destroying you in order to gain the, the power and, and the, the wealth of your realm. It was not, not unusual at all. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, says the Lord, and I will make you a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. He's saying here that the... Um, Messianic line is going through Zerubbabel. Signet ring is just a, you've probably seen these movies, what have you, that when they want to uh, apply an official seal to a letter, you know, they pour wax on it, and they, um, they have a ring, and they stamp it as a signet ring. So it has the official approval of the individual that has the ring. So Zerubbabel has been chosen. The Messiah is going to come through him. So that concludes Haggai. Any comments? So we come to the book of Zechariah. <clears throat> and there's just two more books to go. Zechariah is the longest of the uh, minor prophets. And it may be the most difficult one to, to understand. It's more obscure probably than the other uh, books. In Zechariah, he was, a, of course, a priest. He, was, he operated at the same time as Haggai. He started about three weeks later than Haggai. But uh, he was called to this office of prophet to assist uh, Haggai in stirring up the people to uh, complete the temple. Now, as I say, he began his uh, ministry 
Oh, shortly after Haggai had his first uh, message. And it's a little bit, little bit after the uh, construction on the temple had begun. And you can always think of Haggai as a sequel, I mean, uh, Zechariah as a sequel to Haggai because they're talking of somewhat about the same thing, but certainly a lot different. It happened to be that the temple was uh, begun during a period of conflict, but yeah, there's a lot of opposition, but it was going to be built. And when the people put their mind to it, it did get built. So Zechariah really looks uh, beyond the, uh, this rebuilding of the temple. He looks beyond that to uh, the Messiah and to the spiritual temple of God and the ultimate uh, consummation of God's purpose in bringing about the Messiah, His rule, the glory that is uh, there. As I say, there's much opposition to it, and Jehovah would uh, fight for his people and give them victory. And when I mentioned the destruction of, of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and obviously it's being predicted that it's going to be uh, destroyed, but it was a necessary uh, thing that... Uh, happened because when the first the church first started who was the main opposition to the church well it was the Jews and the Romans at first didn't uh, delineate between the Jews and the Christians to them is it was that religion that came out of uh, Palestine area they didn't really uh, recognize that. And, and when they did recognize that it was something different, it was they really approached it not as a uh, religious concern, because, you know, Romans are just heathens, but it's more pol political. They didn't want, you know, the, the message of the Christians was much more... Uh, universal and Jews and they didn't want that political opposition it did eventually become religious but not initially so uh, how shall we characterize the uh, book of uh, Zechariah like I said it's the longest uh, book and because it uses ap apocalyptic language, it's uh, a little more obscure than the others. And it may, because of that again, may be uh, more difficult to interpret, and we'll get into the apocalyptic language in just a moment. And Jack Ryan, uh is on par... I would say, uh, or at least somewhat, with uh, in, in its messianic uh, impact, it's kind of on par with Isaiah, and both of them uh, reveal the coming of the Messiah and his work. And Zechariah gives emphasis to the visions. You know, there are some visions in Amos, but uh, not to the extent. Of Zechariah, there's eight eight visions that are mentioned, and also we'll see there a lot of angelic uh, mediation. There are a number of angels that are spoken about, and especially in the first six chapters of the book. Another interesting. Side note is that there's, especially from uh, those that are critical of the Bible and its uh, uh, godly origins, 
they would say that first six chapters are written by one person and the last uh, eight chapters by somebody else. But they'll just have to go on thinking that because, you know, history and, and message says that it's one person. And, of course, like I said, uh, there's uh, apocalyptic symbolism in the, uh, the book. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. So, here the, the Messiah is presented as the, the branch or the sprout of David. He comes as a king. He's uh, described as lowly in spirit, providing salvation for his people. He's portrayed as a shepherd that's uh, rejected. He sold for the price of a wounded slave. And he's finally uh, pierced. And then the sheep will, of course, be scattered. But he redeems a, a remnant. There's always the remnant. And through this remnant, the uh, divine uh, sovereignty, sovereignty of uh, Jehovah is uh, restored. And this kingdom, like uh, we just got through uh, talking about, <clears throat> is going to be one of uh, surpassing glory than ever existed before. And everything pertaining to it uh, man, uh, is a manifestation of the glory of God and His, uh, or Jesus, and is dedicated to Him. And those that oppose this uh, new kingdom are going to be defeated. And the prophet uh, Zechariah sees and emphasizes the, the truth that uh, ultimate triumph, and this is true in anything that we do, <coughs> is uh, dependent upon divine cooperation and on the submission of the, the people to God's divine will. And you may re recall uh, Revelation 2.10, <clears throat> it be faithful uh, unto death. You see, receive the crown of life. <clears throat> so if you remain obedient to, and submissive, submissive to uh, God's divine will, then you will be victorious. It's inevitable that that would happen. Now, in studying uh, Zechariah, <clears throat> when we get back to the symbolism, it, of course, uses symbols. And this would be the case if you're talking about uh, Revelation or Daniel or uh, Ezekiel. <clears throat> it, you know, one rule you need to keep in mind is that the book <clears throat> had to mean something to the people to which it was written. <clears throat> Even though, for example, um, Revelation, we may not understand all the symbolism that's in there, but it had to mean something to the people that it was written to. They understood it. It was, uh, of course, written in code so that those that were not Christians wouldn't uh, get the message. But it had to mean something to the people that it was written to. Another thing that you have to keep in mind with respect to uh, uh, apocalyptic language is that all interpretations must be uh, consistent with and harmonious with the total teaching of the scriptures. So that means there must be no conflict or contradiction between the obscure passages and the passages passages that are stated, stated uh, plainly. If there's a conflict, then your interpretation is wrong. You have to come up with another interpretation. So uh, the uh, uses of uh, symbols, Im imagery, and uh, signs here, sometimes they're explained, sometimes they're not. 
Some are veiled. Some are semi-veiled. So one should avoid uh, explaining each aspect of a symbol or look for literalism in the symbols. Symbols, signs, and images are used to express ideas. And they should be taken as a whole. The vision points to a sort of a, a sort of a mosaic, a whole, you know, you know, a mosaic has got little pieces and those pieces make up a, an image. So when it comes to these uh, images, uh, you know, we, one should not be dogmatic about that it has to mean this or that and the other. And I, I remember uh, Foyle Wallace saying that in his book on Revelation is, he says, I don't always know what some of this apocalyptic language means, but I do know what it, what it doesn't mean. And we can know what symbolic language doesn't mean. And again, it, it, you have to look to the uh, plainly stated uh, teachings. And there can be no contradiction. <clears throat> so, here we start in, uh, we won't get far, but we'll start here in chapter 1. In the eighth month of the second year of uh, Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. And you'll see this quite a few times. Uh, you know, that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, or the Lord says, or thus says the Lord. Or, you'll see that quite often. So that gives emphasis to where this message is coming from. The word of the Lord came uh, came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Hedo, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been angry with your fathers. So that's those that were sent into exile. He was angry with them. Therefore say to them, This says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the uh, Lord of hosts. <clears throat> So keep in mind that these uh, uh, Lord returning to them and blessings that come with that is conditional. So blessings are conditional. But so is punishment. That's also conditional. So whether one is punished or one is blessed, it's all based on conditions. If you satisfy the conditions. Do not, verse 4, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, again, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds, but they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. So, they were sent in exile. And he's saying here, don't be like them. Yeah, you know better. Verse 5, it says, Your fathers, where are they? Well, they died. They died in exile. That's where they are. And the prophets, do they live forever? They don't live forever ever either. So those that warned them to, to repent, they're gone also. He said, uh, verse 6, Yet surely my words and my statutes, which, which I commanded uh, my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? Well, they lasted longer than the fathers and the prophets too. So God's word uh, stands firm and whatever he says is fulfilled. So, you know, the word's going to be with us until the end of time, but obviously <laughs> we're not. <laughs> Unless the Lord comes first, we're not going to be around at the end of time. Our time will end. But <laughs> so they returned and said, uh, 
Uh, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways, according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Again, that emphasizes the fact that whatever the Lord says is going to be fulfilled. It will be firm. It will not be uh, altered. Uh, it's it's going, to, going to happen. And we have here a, a series of eight visions. Now, a vision is different than a dream. A dream, of course, you got to be asleep. <clears throat> and, of course, for those of us, uh, you know, my age and Buddy's age, and we don't dream because we don't sleep. <laughs> so just, just you young folks, you know, you, you dream. But a vision, now whether, uh, you, you know, when you're talking about visions, whether, uh, whether the person receiving the vision is in a trance or not, uh, can't really tell, but they're actually, they're not asleep, they actually see it. It may be just an image, it may be, they actually see something, it's a vision. So, here on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shebat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of uh, Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet. He says, I saw by night. So these, these visions are happening at night. He's not asleep now. He's not asleep. And behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind him were horses red, sorrel, and white. Now, I'm not sure what a red horse looks like. It's got to be some sort of shade of red. And I sure don't know what a sorrel is. But white, I got that down. I know what a white horse is. is. <clears throat> but so there there got to be uh, four horses. There's got to be uh, the red one, the man's riding on. And behind him will uh, horses, uh, red, sorrel, and white. And it doesn't say that there are anybody riding on these horses, but we'll see later on that it has to be the case that somebody's riding on these horses. And what does uh, red, sorrel, and white mean? I have no idea. Just different. They're just different horses. <clears throat> there, there's some speculation that they do have... Uh, some meaning in me, maybe they do. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? And this is the Zechariah in his vision talking to the man. So the angel who talked with me, so the angel is the man, and said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to, to walk to and fro throughout the earth. Now, it's the horses that are walking to and fro around uh, among the earth. And you notice that there are four horses. And the, the number four in symbolism is representative of... Uh, world things you know you got the uh, four corners of the earth the four winds uh, things like that north south east and west the four points of the earth so that represent things of, of the earth of the world if you want to call it that <clears throat> so these four they're walking about uh, to and fro about the uh, earth they're keeping watch on the earth so they, verse 11, so they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees. I guess it's myrtle trees. It's kind of like the myrtle trees we have here. Or maybe, maybe not. And said, we have walked to and fro throughout the earth. And behold, all the earth is resting quietly. And that's how I know that there's got to be men on these horses. Because horses are not talking. And so he, he's, uh, okay, I'm not going to talk anymore either. But anyway, the horses are not talking, so I know there's, there's got to be men or angels, whatever whatever these beings are. they got to be on the horses that are walking to and fro on the earth, and, and it, we'll find out next week what, what they had to say about it. So we'll start uh, 
verse 12 next week.